So on this one, the rate, well, as soon as you try to look at the rate, you see that there's a problem because this one is actually irregular. So how's, what's the best way of working out the rate when you've got irregularity? Well, the most accurate way is to count up the number of QRSs on the rhythm strip and multiply it by 6, which will give us 108. The other option is just to eyeball what looks like a fairly typical complex and say it's about 100 beats per minute, which suffices for most circumstances. Next is the rhythm. We've already said it's irregular. And there are no P waves here. It's irregularly irregular, irregularly irregular with no P waves. And that's usually atrial fibrillation. Finally, let's look at the axis. Now, I told you to look at lead one and lead two. But here you can see that they're both negative, And I didn't tell you what to do with that one. So the most common cause for this is actually that the leads have been put on the wrong way around. There are rare causes such as dextrocardia and severe pulmonary hypertension, but it's far more common that this is just a mistake in the recording. And if ever you do see a negative lead one and lead two, do go back and check whether the leads have been put on correctly. If that's not possible, then see if there's an old ECG for comparison, because as I say, this is often just a problem with the recording. If you look in V1, V2 and V3, there is one slightly strange, larger, broader beat. This is a ventricular ectopic. These often look broad and very different from the shape of the other complexes. We'll see those on other ECGs as we go through as well. They're broad because they're not using the Hisbukindji system and therefore they're a very different shape. So you can see here, negative in one, negative in two, away from one, away from two, completely wrong, totally wrong. Go back and check your lead positions. So let's move on to some different ECGs now. We're going to concentrate on some of the acute coronary syndrome ECGs today. So here we have an ECG of an unknown person. And uh, in terms of technical um, issues, the calibration box looks fine. There's a little bit of uh, electrical interference, but generally it's a pretty good recording. The rate here is three squares, so 300 divided by three is 100 beats per minute. The rhythm is regular and the axis is normal. There are P waves present, so this is normal sinus rhythm. So now we look to see if there's any obvious abnormality. And here there is quite striking ST elevation in the inferior leads. It's most obvious in lead three. So if you spot an abnormality in one lead, think about what other leads go with this. So here for the inferior leads, it would be leads two, three, and AVF. And you can see that there is a degree of elevation in all of these leads. There's also some Q-wave formation, which is where the first part of the QRS complex goes straight downwards. This is very clear to see in lead 3 and in AVF. So this is an acute inferior ST elevation MI. There's some ST depression in leads 1 and AVL. These are kind of opposite leads on the limb leads. So often if you get elevation in the inferior leads, you'll get reciprocal ST depression in the high lateral leads. And similarly, if you get elevation in 1 and AVL, you'll see depression in leads 2, 3 and AVF. This can be very helpful if the ST elevation is very subtle. You only require one millimetre of ST elevation in two of these leads to activate the primary PCI um, team for a, for a myocardial infarction, for example, and it's important to get the decision right. One millimetre be, can be quite difficult to spot and quite difficult to be certain whether it is truly there. And if you see those reciprocal changes as well, they can really help to confirm it for you. If you do see both elevation and depression on an ECG, it's important to mention the elevation first. This is the most significant finding and then the depression afterwards. So this is an acute inferior ST elevation MI. Here we've got a rate of around 80 beats per minute uh, with a normal regular sinus rhythm with P waves present and the axis is normal again with positive deflection in lead one and two. The obvious abnormality here is that we've got ST elevation in leads V1, V2, V3 and V4. It could be quite difficult to spot where the elevation is when you have this degree of elevation where the Q, where the ST segments are is quite hard to see because it runs into the large T waves. You can also see that there are some S, there's some ST depression some reciprocal changes in leads 3 and AVF. So if we look at the sequence of events the sequence of changes that you get on an ECG with the STEMI the first change is that you get hyperacute T waves. These are often not seen in hospital because they occur in the community before the patient has even rung for an ambulance. They can be quite transient. The hyperacute T waves are usually followed by ST elevation. And this is the, obviously the change that gives the name to a STEMI. 
The J point is the point just at the beginning of the ST segment. And when we talk about the amount of ST elevation, this is where we measure it. For example, here you can see there's around four millimeters of ST elevation. As time goes on, and the time course is very variable for these changes, after the ST elevation you develop T wave inversion and then Q wave formation. You can have small Q waves on a normal ECG, but if you look on here you can see how over time the Q wave is getting deeper and broader as the STEMI develops. Eventually, if you leave them alone, the patients alone, the ST segments will come down. And if you leave it even longer, the T waves will eventually go back upright as well. But once you have a Q wave, that's there forever, and it will not go away. Obviously, what you want to do is to try to catch the patient early on in their infarction, somewhere in the top line. And if you take them to the cath lab and open up their coronary artery and get reperfusion, the ST segments will usually come down. Indeed, if you catch them early enough, the ECG might almost go back to normal. Pathological Q waves, there are lots of definitions, but this is a fairly simple one. As I said, you can have very small Q waves on an ECG, which are due to septal depolarization. But as a guide, if a Q wave is more than a quarter of the height of the following R wave in depth, and more than a millimetre wide, then it is abnormal. So in other words, if your R wave's eight millimetres and your Q wave's more than two millimetres, then it's abnormal. Also, look for patterns. Is it in more than one lead in one territory? That can also be helpful. Patholo new pathological Q waves are diagnostic of an MI, and once you have them, they do persist. This is just a revision of the territories. 2, 3 and AVF are your inferior leads. Some people say it looks a bit like a shoe or a boot, which I suppose is at the end of your leg at the inferior side of it. Anterior are quite easy to remember. V1 to V4, they're just stuck on the front of the chest. The lateral leads are probably the hardest ones to remember because they're scattered across the ECG. So you've got V5 and V6, but also leads 1 and AVL. So here you can see this patient's having a large anterolateral infarction with some ST depression in the reciprocal leads inferiorly. The site of ST elevation does give you a clue as to which coronary artery is occluded. So an anterior MI is usually due to an LAD occlusion. An inferior MI is usually due to a right coronary artery occlusion or sometimes a large circumflex artery. And lateral infarctions are often due to a circumflex inclusion occlusion or a diagonal occlusion, occasionally an, even an LAD. This is quite useful when we're going in to do a primary PCI because when we do these, these um, primary PCIs, the vessel is usually totally blocked and you cannot see it at all. So if you have some idea which vessel you're heading for, it can give you some indication where you're going. We do use these, ST, these ECG changes to help us to determine which patients have a primary percutaneous coronary intervention for a STEMI. They were used previously for deciding who had thrombolysis. So the definitions that we use currently are that we take patients straight to the cath lab if the patient has had cardiac chest pain, usually for less than 12 hours, and they have two millimetres of ST elevation in two chest leads or one millimetre in two limb leads. Contiguous means adjacent on the body in terms of the leads. Now, some patients have a new left bundle branch block pattern along with chest pain as their presentation for an MI. Sometimes these patients will be taken directly to the cath lab in certain areas. However, a lot of patients have left bundle branch block patterns on their ECGs and um, chest pain is quite a common presentation. So in our hospital, these go to A&E for a quick assessment by a doctor and comparison with old ECGs. And obviously, if they do think it's a STEMI and the whole, the whole uh, picture fits together, we will still take them directly to the cardiac catheter lab. But patients who have got significant ST elevation with chest pain are brought directly to the cath lab by the paramedics without even going anywhere near A&E, which prevents any delays. So you can see how important it is to be able to identify ST elevation on an ECG as it determines the treatment for this very important condition. There are, of course, some slightly greyer cases which you have to judge on a patient by patient basis. If patient has one and a half millimetres of ST elevation with typical symptoms, then of course following discussion we'll usually take them. Another group is those who have transient ST elevation. In general, I will take those directly as well because they usually infarct later on.
And of course, there are those who have had pain for slightly over 12 hours. Again, if they've got ongoing pain with ST elevation, I will tend to take them to the cath lab. But you have to accept that the likelihood of getting a good result in terms of preservation of left ventricular function afterwards is less if the artery has been occluded for longer. So it's always a balance of the risks and benefits. So ST elevation MIs, they form a small, well, about a third of the acute coronary syndromes that we see. More common is to get the non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes, and generally this is a slightly harder group to identify. Um, it's sometimes difficult to know whether they're truly a non-ST elevation MI when patients had some slightly atypical chest pain and a troponin rise, or if it's just an elderly patient with comorbidities who's come in with an acute infection or some other reason why they've become unwell and they've got an elevation in their troponin. So the ECGs that you can get with non-ST elevation MIs are also a little bit harder to, to define. Occasionally, the ECG will appear normal. But the more common ECGs that you get with non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes are abnormal T-wave inversion and ST depression. On this ECG, we have a rate of 66 beats per minute. It is irregularly irregular and there are no P-waves. So this is atrial fibrillation. The axis is normal, being an upward deflection in both leads 1 and lead 2. The abnormality here is that we have quite widespread T-wave inversion in leads where there should not be T-wave inversion. And this may well be an ECG from a patient with a non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. It's very important with ECGs like this that you put the ECG in the context of the clinical picture. Occasionally, patients will have had an ECG like this for many years, and it's important to compare it with previous ECGs. But if they present with a history, for example, of long-standing angina, which has become worse over the past two or three weeks, and the last couple of days they've been waking up in the night with it, and today it went off with the GTM, but then it came back 20 minutes later and still niggling now, they may well be uh, a very good story for a non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. The other ECG that you get with non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes is ST depression. This is a particularly high risk ECG. These patients actually do much worse in the long run. Patients with STEMIs, they have a higher risk of sudden cardiac death early on in their presentation from arrhythmias, cardiac rupture and acute pulmonary edema. But if they get past this stage, then these patients actually do better in the long term than those with ST depression on their presenting ECG. This is a particularly unpleasant ECG here. The rate is 75 beats per minute and regular with P waves, sinus rhythm. There is a borderline left axis deviation with the deflection being slightly more down in lead two than up. But the most striking abnormality is that there is widespread downsloping ST depression. Downsloping ST depression is particularly indicative of ischemia. You can also see that there is ST elevation in lead AVR this doesn't count as a lead for thrombolysis and so on, but if you see ST elevation in lead AVR, it can be very suggestive that the patient has a left main stem stenosis. Sometimes these patients have severe critical three vessel disease, but this gentleman did indeed have a left main stem stenosis. The ST depression can be dynamic, so it will come and go with the chest pain. So if you give this patient some IV beta blocker or some GTN and their pain settles, the ST depression will probably improve. As I say, this is a very high-risk ECG, and this patient will almost certainly require management on the coronary care unit. They may well require intravenous nitrates, and often they need to go to the cath lab sooner rather than later. If the patient is not settling down, they need urgent discussion with a cardiologist. So what's actually happening in the coronary arteries in these patients? Well, we start to build up our coronary atheroma from the age of about 30. But often it doesn't cause problems until later in life when it's causing narrowings of around 70 to 80 percent and you start to get exertional angina. However, acute coronary syndromes can sometimes happen on even mild narrowings. What happens is you have a plaque event, a rupture or a fissure within a coronary plaque and then platelets come and aggregate and stick and they release thrombin and generate lots of um, uh, thrombus. If I go and do an angiogram on a patient having a STEMI, I will usually find that the artery is completely occluded and there is no flow down the vessel. With end STEMIs, 
Often we'll find that there's a critical lesion, maybe some thrombus hanging around, but there's usually some flow down the artery. The reason why we have to take the stem is directly to the cath lab is because these vessels do not generally have collateral, so as soon as they block off completely, infarction begins to occur downstream, and therefore the sooner you get the artery open, the better the preservation of um, left ventricular function. Of course, the end stemmies can progress onto stemmies and they need careful watching. They should not be thought of as being low risk, especially those with ST depression who often have very critical disease. So we end up with a spectrum of coronary disease through angina, unstable angina and myocardial infarction. So angina, obviously the symptoms usually occur on exertion or on stress. They're relieved by rest or GTN. However, with the acute coronary syndrome, symptoms may happen at rest or on minimal um, exertion. With myocardial infarctions, you may have ST elevation, the STEMIs, the ones that we take directly to the cath lab. Or you may occasionally have a normal ECG, but at usually ST depression or T-wave inversion. We then obviously check the blood tests, and if the troponin goes up, then that indicates myocardial injury, and therefore in this context we would call this a myocardial infarction. Occasionally, you get a patient who truly has unstable coronary symptoms, may have ECG changes, but does not have a troponin elevation. This is much less common nowadays because the troponins are so sensitive they tend to pick up even minuscule bits of damage. So we see unstable angina much less commonly now. A negative troponin often points to a good prognosis. However, do be aware of the patients who present with typical symptoms, especially if they have ECG changes, even if their troponins are negative. So that's the end of our presentation for today. Hopefully we've given you a good introduction to the interpretation of ECGs and a methodical approach to these. And we've run through some important ECGs for acute coronary syndromes. Thank you very much.